When halfway through the journey of our life, I was in a gloomy wood because the path which led her right was lost. These are the opening lines of Dante's Divine Comedy, and I think they do a good job of describing the feel and setting of Yakuza 7. Though it might not be obvious at the outset. This thought, though, captures something I find really fascinating and something which I think Like a Dragon's story conveys better than any other piece of media I've ever encountered. It's one thing to feel lost in your youth. You might even think that it's entirely normal in most cases, but it's an entirely different feeling of existential dread to have reached middle age and then suddenly find that after overcoming the trials of youth and finding your way in the adult world to suddenly have that peace taken away from you. As young adults, we attempt to find a path through life, and as anyone can tell you, though, losing something you've had is more painful than never having had it in the first place. For me, this sense of being lost in middle age, in a world you don't understand, is one of the things that makes Yakuza 7 one of the most compelling RPGs I've played in recent times, to the extent that I think it's in the running for one of the best narratives ever put into an RPG. The main character of Yakuza 7 Like a Dragon, Ichiban, has a journey not too dissimilar to that that caused Dante to write his masterwork of fiction. Both Dante and Ichiban created fictional versions of themselves to escape their circumstances. One is a poet on an ascent from a hell to heaven. One is a JRPG hero slaying dragons, although those dragons are often just mobsters. This side of Like a Dragon is fascinating to me, and we'll get back to that later on as we've discussed more of the game and its story. In all honesty, before playing the game, I didn't really see how I could enjoy a modern RPG to the extent of any of the games I used to play. Don't get me wrong. I still have fun playing RPGs and talking about them on the internet. I think they're the best genre of game, and I think people have had just as many profound narrative and emotional moments playing RPGs as they have from watching television or reading books. But for me... I was pretty sure I'd lost some of that magic along the way. Just enjoying a game is not the same thing as being sat up at 1 o'clock in the morning in 2001, hunched over your PC listening in fear to John Arenica's monologues, or hearing Kafka's creepy MIDI laugh through cheap speakers in Final Fantasy VI on the PS1. There's a fundamental difference between enjoying a game and feeling that artistic and narrative magic that only strikes every so often and often depends on factors about you and your life that are outside of the game, and not determined by either its narrative or its mechanics. Yakuza managed to give me these good vibes again, and I think that is in large part because, like myself, Yakuza is a grown-up RPG in many respects, and it is self-conscious about that fact. If only it respected my adult time a little bit more, but that's something we'll discuss later. In the end, Yakuza 7 has really helped reignite my love of RPGs through its amazing story, sense of comedy, and old-school combat system. So let's get into it. The development of Yakuza 7 is reasonably, as far as I can tell, uninteresting and unproblematic. It was announced on the 29th of August, 2019. I must admit that at the time, the game largely flew over my radar as I was very busy teaching in graduate school at the time and just generally out of the RPG scene. And also, I'd never really super gotten into the Yakuza games, so I had messed around with them before. Looking at the game's development, things seem generally unremarkable on that level as well. The game was described by many as an attempt to introduce elements from Square Enix's Dragon Quest series into the Yakuza universe. In this sense, this would be Sega's first foray into the single-player JRPG market since the days of the original Fantasy Star games, with the founder of Ryu Gagutaku Studios receiving permission from Yuji Horii, the founder of Dragon Quest itself, to reference the IP so heavily in the game's narrative, again something we'll see as we progress through this video. Comments from the developers were reasonably simple and basic all citing the need to create a JRPG that was fun for players, while at the same time forwarding a compelling crime plot of the type common in the Yakuza series. Yakuza 7 is really a very simple game, but a simple game with a compelling story and functional game mechanics. And it is with the story that we really need to start this retrospective. The game really shines because so many elements of its design are entirely unpretentious and instead let the game focus on the incredible story that it tries to tell. We begin the game as Ichiban Kazuya, a young Yakuza enforcer, orphaned and born in a soapland, a kind of Japanese bathhouse. 
After a short life of petty crime, at the age of 16, he makes the mistake of robbing a local Yakuza. He is unable to escape their reprisals, and upon being captured and brutally tortured by the group, he makes a Hail Mary attempt to save his life by claiming that he, in fact, too, is a Yakuza, and they should be wary of what they do to him, because he claims to know a well-known Yakuza family head named Masumi Arakawa, a.k.a. Arakawa the assassin. Hearing this name, the gang immediately contacts the Arakawa family. And to Ichiban Kazuya's surprise, Arakawa the assassin shows up. But we need to backtrack a bit, because the game doesn't actually begin with our protagonist. It begins instead with Masumi Arakawa. If Ichiban is the protagonist, Masumi Arakawa is the catalyst for the events that are about to unfold. We begin the game seeing him far from being a Yakuza family leader. Instead, the opening scene shows Masumi playing the female lead in his family theater troupe, as the part of the avenging heroine of the story, surrounded by a rapturous applause. Japanese theater, much like its western counterparts, has throughout history had a habit of casting boys in female roles. The intro is one built of two contrasting aspects. The praise with which Masumi is showered on stage by the audience for his amazing performance, and the contrast of that with the horrors of his family life in the theater troupe behind the scenes. While he is a hero adored on stage, he suffers at the hands of the horrific behavior of his mother, and watches as the father, the man he looks to protect him, is both manipulated and shamed. This sets the stage for what Masumi Arakawa is to become in the story. The strong patriarch, the father that people like Ichiban never had. And this little scene does an incredible job of telling you exactly who he is and why he becomes who he is. While his father cannot stand up to his mother directly, he does provide care for his son in the form of food, in this case Peking Duck, something that will feature throughout the story. Whether Masumi Arakawa or the Seiryu clan leader Hashino, as we'll come to see later on, it becomes a simple, albeit a delicious one, of the protection that paternal figures provide to those under them and a common theme throughout the rest of the game. Masumi Arakawa's road from actor to Yakuza patriarch and captain begins at the restaurant. While waiting for his food, Masumi's father is executed while he is in the bathroom washing his hands. Upon the realization of his father's death, the narrative then jumps to the year 2000, with Masumi now the head of a Yakuza family, leaving the player to initially fill in the blanks of how this timid young man became the head of a Yakuza family. This introduction is important for the player to understand who Masami Arakawa is, so that they can, in a short time, come to understand why Ichiban, our protagonist, comes to have the level of loyalty for him that he does, a loyalty that's crucial in explaining how the plot will progress. Most of the early story of the game is spent building up the relationship between Masumi and Ichiban. It's revealed that Ichiban was saved that day by Masumi, who in keeping with Yakuza tradition offered a finger in exchange for letting Ichiban free. In return, Ichiban swears loyalty to the Arakawa Yakuza, and much like the loyal dogs that Japanese culture has historically prized so much, he decides to sit every day in front of their clan HQ, waiting for a chance to join. All of this builds up to one singular idea that the mind of the player is supposed to grasp, and I love this clear singular focus in the introduction of the game. Nothing is wasted. It's a justification for the rest of the story. The purpose of Ichiban Kajua's seemingly driftless life at this point, is his loyalty to Masumi Arakawa and the status he has earned as a Yakuza, even if he's just a low-level grunt. To him, there could be nothing better than living the life of loyalty to the man who saved him, to the substitute father he forced to adopt him out of desperation. And the way in which he exhibits this loyalty is through taking care of the sickly Masato Arakawa, Masumi's sullen and angry son. The player takes control of Ichiban on Masato Arakawa's birthday, as Ichiban proceeds through the events of the tutorial that also serve to further these narrative elements. The final task of this opening scene and the conclusion to the tutorial is to escort the 
Waka, or young master, on his birthday to spend time with his girlfriend. You'll notice I haven't talked about the combat yet, because the combat is standard JRPG combat, and we'll get into that more later, but I'm kind of assuming you as my audience know how an RPG plays at this point. Let's continue with the story. So Masada refuses to allow her to see him in his wheelchair in sickly state, and so he takes the rather extreme and totally healthy measure of shooting himself up with epinephrine in the chest before heading into the hostess club, where his quote-unquote girlfriend works. At this point, Masato's illness is unexplained, but it's worth paying attention to at this point because it's going to come up again. It's pretty immediately clear that Masato's girlfriend is just a hostess interested in the large stacks of cash he happily flaunts. For those that don't know, hostess clubs in Japan are bars where there are hostess girls that pay attention to you and serve you drinks and do things like that. And so the idea that he's actually constituted a real relationship with a hostess is immediately sort of cringe, as the kids would say. And the truth of this cringeness is soon revealed when both Ichiban and Masato witness the woman talking to the local police chief while engaging in certain activities in the host club's bathroom. They discuss how Masato is a fool and that Yakuza are trash. The stacks of cash Masato throws about don't impress them. Masato is not cool. He's a creep with too much money and a propensity for violence. This scene is painful to watch as someone with a very low cringe threshold. And just as perfectly as the intro sets up the relationship between Ichiban and Masumi, that is Masato's father, this moment of crushing personal humiliation provides the perfect catalyst for Masato's own development into what should be pretty obvious to the player at this point, the game's villain. Angered, Masato flees the location without his guardian Ichiban, and that is the last we will hear from Masato for a while. And if you've been paying attention so far, you might think that these missing hours will be crucial to understanding the game's story, and you wouldn't be wrong. Upon returning to Masumi to report back on his task, Masumi offers to take Ichiban out for Peking Duck, to the exact same restaurant as far as I can tell, that his father took him. He tells Ichiban the story of how he attempted to flee from persecution by a Yakuza because he got the boss's daughter pregnant. The child was born and hidden by her in a coin locker in Shinjuku Station in Tokyo. By the time Masumi arrived to retrieve the child from the locker, it had suffered advanced hypothermia. It was this damage that left his son, Masato, in his now disabled state, and something he blames himself very deeply for. As the two approach the restaurant, in a symbolic twist, it is closed. After all, it is New Year's Eve. The duck will have to wait, and in this case, quite a long time. The next day, Masumi calls Ichiban into a meeting and immediately informs him that their captain, Sawashiro, has committed a murder on another family within the same Tojo clan that they exist in, and that if the police were to arrest him, the clan is likely to collapse without the importance of his leadership. Now, the small criticism I have of this story is that Sawashiro is actually quite important to the story, but you wouldn't know it at this point, so just keep his ugly face in mind. Ichiban jumps at a chance to exhibit his loyalty to the clan by taking the prison charge himself, something in my research for this video I've discovered is not too uncommon at this time in the history of Yakuza, for younger members, that is, to take prison sentences for older members who have longer rap sheets and thus will get a much diminished time in prison, to the extent that the police and the courts seem to accept this as a way of engaging with the formalities of the criminal underworld. So the idea that Ichiban can literally just take the charge follows in line with everything that seems common to me about Yakuza. Ichiban heads to a bar to eat beef noodles, then to the police station, and then into 18 long years in prison, a sentence extended from 15 to 18 by his loyal defense of the Tojo clan behind bars. Upon finally leaving prison, Ichiban is shocked to find no one to greet him besides a police detective, Adachi, who wants his assistance with investigating a local politician and his relationship with the local police. Yes, the same local police chief from the toilet. He was going to come back up again. He believes this police chief has ties to the criminal underworld. Being aware that Ichiban would be released in a world where his beloved Tojo clan is no more, Adachi suspects that Ichiban may be helpful against the powerful Omi clan that have now taken over the game's fictional setting of Kamachuro. Ichiban is shocked by these revelations, and slowly, he discovers his new reality, the unbelievable truth 
that Masumi Arakawa is now a captain of their opposing Ami clan and helped to destroy the very clan that Ichiban gave up 18 years of his life for. It is at this point that the story really started to grip me. While so many JRPG protagonists are young men or boys, or gritty fill-in protagonists where the player can just project themselves onto the protagonist, looking at you, Persona series, Ichiban is not you. He is very much a complete character in his own right, with lots of experiences he brings to the story that the player probably doesn't have, unless you're a Yakuza watching this. But like the Dante quote, which I began this retrospective with, he too is lost in the woods of his early 40s. He is not in the world he thought existed beyond those bars for 18 years, and also not in a world that he recognizes anymore. Like the loyal dog he is, Ichiban will not rest until he gets a chance to speak to Masumi Arakawa and confirm what Adachi has told him. So Adachi joins as our first party member as we fight through the only alliance guards and into the meeting of captains. Basically, the game's first short dungeon. At the end of it, Ichiban confronts Masumi about his betrayal of the Tojo clan. This essentially is the game's tutorial dungeon, as I've said before, and all we learn about combat at this point is using the attack button and a few special moves. Overall, standard RPG fare, and as I've already said before, I'll delve into combat when we've developed things a little bit more on in this retrospective. Upon fighting our way to the top of the building, Ichiban is greeted by Masumi in a way which causes his world to finally come completely crashing down. Masumi stands up from his chair and says cryptically, Everything is as I knew it would be. I'm sorry, Ichi. You're going to have to die for me. There's a wonderful ambiguity to this line. Is Masumi a traitor annoyed at Ichiban's loyalty, or is there something more at work? Well, that is at least initially immediately answered. Masumi proceeds to shoot Ichiban, fade to black, enter logo, and the game has finally begun in earnest. In a scene that, at least on its face, mocks Ichiban's unyielding loyalty, we begin the game. All these early moments of gameplay were all building to one thing. Ichiban's life fell to bits after 18 years of service to the Yakuza. And when the game resumes, he has since died and been born again. He died out of loyalty to Masumi Arakawa. But this betrayal now has a positive dimension. He's now free. Ichiban awakes in a pile of garbage in what he will soon find out is Izakai Jinko. Wounded but not dead, with a misprinted yen bill in his front pocket, with a misprinted back on it. And this bill will sort of become the game's MacGuffin leading the plot forward. He befriends the locals in the homeless camp, along with the nurse who patched him up, Nanba Yu, a former nurse now forced onto the streets after being fired due to substance abuse problems resulting in theft of drugs from where he was working. Nanba begins to teach Ichiban the ways of his life as a new homeless man, while Ichiban, using his Yakuza fighting skills, helps the homeless stand up to the exploitative Chinese mafia. It doesn't take long for Ichiban's go-getter spirit to get the two off the streets. As they agree to work together, they begin work as security guards for a local hotel of a particular type for short-term activities. The duo then learn of Bleach Japan, an organization aimed at removing the gray zones of criminal activity within the city, the very group that are harassing these types of institutions, they are hired by a local madam of this hotel to defend it from Bleach Japan's intrusions. They do good work because these are really easy fights for someone of Ichiban's Yakuza skills. And as a result of their success, they're granted a small one-room flat to be housed in. Ichiban and his newfound friend Nanba are now relaxing and reflecting on the fact that they are no longer homeless. And I guarantee you, if you've ever been homeless, that feeling of having a roof over your head really is that relaxing regardless of what roof it is just to know that it's there it's at this point the two enter into conversation with namba asking ichiban what he wanted to be when he was a kid before prison before the yakuza presumably and it's ichiban's answer to this question that really sets up the rest of the game at least for me ichiban explains that he wanted to be a hero like in the dragon quest games 
This scene really captures, for me, what makes Yakuza like a dragon so endearing. The characters and voice acting are completely believable, the themes are gritty and real, but all of this is united by an almost meta-obsession with the very subject matter of the game itself. That is, it is a JRPG. And it is here that the game's aesthetic takes an interesting twist, as from this moment on, whenever the party engage with various baddies or different aspects of the plot, a sudden magical realist twist will emerge where the enemies are transmogrified or transformed into fantastical creatures or the like. Now that he's lost everything and has no direction, Namba suggests that Ichiban just embrace the absurdity of this idea of being a Dragon Quest hero. Why not embrace a life of leveling up? With my limited understanding of Japanese here, this seems to indicate a double meaning, both leveling up in a computer game to deal with harder to face enemies, but in Japanese this seems to also be able to imply pulling yourself up or rising up from the difficulties and events you face in life, much like in English you might say pulling yourself up from your own bootstraps. A bit of a philosophical insert here, I apologize for. Yakuza is a game of two sides, one gritty crime drama and the other an almost comical Takashi-style castle of Japanese humor, only about a homeless middle-aged man engaging in a real-life JRPG. The humor is incredibly slapstick, so much so that if Ichiban is successful enough at running his small business, he can gain the ability to slap enemies with large stacks of cash for damage, to mention one of only many hugely slapstick aspects of the game's style and narrative. On the other hand, the game is also 100% a Yakuza game, albeit with mechanics with a clear but comical tribute to Dragon Quest, from HP to SP to characters just gaining new abilities as they progress their jobs and levels. The combination of gritty crime narrative and JRPG combat, though, should be jarring, and initially, before I ever played the game, this is what I was concerned with. And, in a sense, I was right. The combination of gritty crime drama and JRPG is jarring, but in a way which for me never stopped me from being immersed in the combat or story. If anything, it enhanced how much I enjoyed the game. But before we get into that, there's something interesting I want to discuss that's worth bringing up, I think, in a video essay on these types of games that's been raised a lot by recent commentators, and that is this concept of ludo-narrative harmony, or the relationship between a game, aka ludos, and the narrative. The term was coined by Clint Hawking in 2007 to describe the ways in which a game's gameplay itself either clashes or harmonizes with the narrative aspect of that very game. For example, Stardew Valley is a story about fixing up your grandpa's old farm and his hopes that you would improve the town and make friends while doing so. The gameplay in turn is entirely harmonized to the general narrative that the game presents to the player. By contrast, a game about a war despising pacifists standing up to an imperial authoritarian regime but where the gameplay requires the player to slaughter thousands of enemies each level really doesn't match up with the protagonist's pacifistic and anti-violent goals and there are a thousand games i can think of that clash in this way but a personal aside here as someone with a background in ancient greek i really don't like the term ludology this is going to sound very pedantic, but hear me out, because I don't really like it when essayists make up words that don't have a strong cultural or linguistic background. Ludos is the Latin word for game, and logia is the Greek word for, well, almost everything. But in this context, it means something like a reasoned account of the thing in question. The term ludology was coined by famous British linguist and game lover, Birmingham professor Irving Finkel. This is and turn a very modern term and uh, something that slightly breaks the rules of classical scholarship, probably for his own amusement. But my own pedantry aside, let's go into why I think Yakuza 7 challenges the idea that ludonarrative harmony is actually a criterion for a game to work. A better way of looking at these issues, at least I think, is to see whether the values the game's narrative espouses can be made sense of within the game's gameplay. This isn't about narrative harmony, I don't like this postmodern world in which everything is just narrative. To me, it's about the values and the lives of the characters, even if the characters are just fictional entities. That might be the case with literature, but for games, I think it's different. The amazing thing about games is that they are more than just the narratives. They are interactive mediums within themselves. 
Sure, a reader does interact with a book, and scholars have discussed reader response theory for years, but a game is so much more than that. We are more than just a consumer of the narratives we play. We don't just respond, we shape them by our experiences of playing the game itself. Different types of gamer experience games, even reasonably linear games like something like Yakuza 7, in different ways. How many times have us older gamers figured out in the past few years that a game hits differently depending upon the point of our lives that we play it in? When we play a game, we form our own values about both the gameplay and the narrative. And that's why no morality wheel in Mass Effect or Fable can capture the way we relate to the game. I think my TLDR here, and I'll stop this rant now, so please don't click off the video. Even if ludonarrative harmony is a helpful way of describing a good or functional relationship between a game's core gameplay and its narrative, Yakuza 7 just proves that that relationship is a sufficient, but not a necessary condition for a good game. Ludo narrative harmony can presumably make a game better, but dissonance can also make a game be fun. If anything, the combination of Yakuza 7's gritty crime drama narrative with something that would fit better into the Western canon of TV like The Wire and The Sopranos does not naturally fit in the JRPG format. Let's be real. And that might make you think that this game falls afoul of the Ludo narrative harmony criterion. But just like punk rock can be as fun as classical music, Yakuza takes the dissonance of these two aspects and makes a game that feels genuinely fun. There's just a sort of punk rock ethos to the game and its developers that I've really enjoyed. And I hope to explore this type of dissonance in future retrospectives on this channel. But anyways, let's end this round and get back to it. All in all, I don't think these abstract discussions are an accurate way of capturing what makes Yakuza's gameplay and narrative gel together. They work because they're fun, and when you're having fun, things that you might otherwise criticize or that might bother you aren't there. Boulder's Gate 3 was incredibly buggy on launch and no one noticed. Minecraft had shallow gameplay on launch and no one noticed. Technically, most JRPGs in the world are just walking forward until you hit the next cutscene, but no one complains about that when it comes to Final Fantasy VII. The question is whether the person playing them is having fun and whether these elements all congeal together to make for fun. And Yakuza 7 is a load of fun. Until the times it isn't. This is probably a good point to warn everyone that maybe hasn't played the game but is watching this retrospective about the game's difficulty spikes. Something that is without a doubt a major reason why this game was rated a 7 out of 10 by a lot of reviewers rather than a 10 out of 10. Its difficulty is remarkably inconsistent. While a lot or even most modern JRPGs have gotten pretty good at difficulty scaling, Yakuza apparently does not care about this modern trend and battles will go from incredibly boring to your main character being one-shot by a single ability if you do not grind before the battle. The game even has moments in the story later that will build these special abilities into the events of the story and the battles themselves, so if you lack the necessary defensive stats or HP, your character will simply lose. And this is an old-school RPG in the form of games like Baldur's Gate or other old-school JRPGs where if the protagonist is knocked down, there are no more revives and the battle is over. I believe this difficulty is intentional to add drama to the game. It really does make some of the game's more epic battles feel just that, a lot more epic. Also, the game avoids following the pattern of many other modern JRPGs, looking at you, Dragon Quest XI, where at a certain point you've built up your characters well enough and outleveled the game enough that you can sort of begin to steamroll the content, making the game's most dramatic battles and narrative moments sort of easy. And the fact that the game offers no modal difficulty, that is, no easy, hard, or other ways to modify the difficulty, this means that each person experiences is similar and each person will have the same epic experience of trying to struggle through the narrative moments of the game where the combat becomes quite tough, thus making each of those battles feel more epic. But there's certainly a downside to doing things this way. And it really can feel at times like the game is really padding out its difficulty. And also, while we're at it, discussing the game's negatives, let's discuss another potential negative of the game, and that is the mini games can pad out the length of the game in a way that might surprise you, especially if you're not used to playing this kind of game. 
So, as someone new to the Yakuza series and coming in with a limited experience of the franchise's minigames, you might be forgiven for coming in thinking that the minigames are entirely optional, as they normally are in most JRPGs, at least the ones that I've played. Think Triple Triad and Final Fantasy VIII. While you can't ignore the bits where you collect 10 cans for tokens or fending off somatic sheep during optional B-films, there are some activities that just provide slight benefits. However, two of the game's minigames are, at least in my opinion, largely necessary to progress through the game in a reasonable fashion. The first is the management minigame. If you don't play it at all and at least reach rank 150 in the stock market, you will miss out on an entire optional character that's quite nice to have. Yes, an entire character that is just as fully fleshed out as everyone else, at least almost, and you'll miss out on them and their cutscenes and the entire pl plot and you'll miss out on them and their cutscenes and entire plot points related to Ichiban's rise to the top if you don't play this minigame. This minigame is lengthy. If you're not very good at it like me and are not experienced with the Yakuza series, it can take some time to master. But I'll get back to the nature of the minigame itself later on. The important point here is that it gives you an optional character. And you might be asking, well, Old Man Banjo, why do you really need an optional character? If you have a party of four, that should be fine, right? Because that's the size of the party in the game, by the way. Well... As you're about to see when we return to the narrative, there is a section in which you lose your fourth party member, meaning you'll be down one party member for a few of the toughest fights the game can offer early on, and this can make things tricky to deal with. The game also gives you no indication that the minigame will provide you with this extra party member, particularly one with amazing abilities like Thumbtack Scatter, which is one of the best AoE abilities in the game and also just incredibly fun. Safe to say not having Eri Kamataki at this point in the game dramatically increases the difficulty. Secondly, there is also a section further in the game, as we'll see, where the player must raise over 3 million yen, which is most easily done by playing this CEO minigame where you will gain a large wage as you progress through the higher levels. This is optional content, but it's optional in a very loose sense of the world. You really should do it to enjoy the game to its full, but it can be confusing what content is simply optional and what content is something the player really does need to engage with to get the most out of the game, given all the mini games that are available. Another aspect of the game that is not optional but could appear so is the Battle Tower, a mall under construction that has been transformed into floors of a battle arena. You could skip this content, but the amount of XP and items provided is rather high and also rather important to progress, something we'll discuss more later on. But let's return to the story for now. The party so far, now composed of Nanba, Adachi, and Ichiban, seek work through Hello Worka local job center. Now, I don't know if your country has this, but I grew up in the UK, and probably that's the reason for the schizophrenic accent throughout narrating this video. But I was in my 20s during the recession of 08, and for many people in the UK, that meant a lot of time at the UK's version of Hello Work. And I was actually shocked to find that Japan has something similar. But the party do find work here. They find work for a local soapland owner named Nonomiya. But just in case people don't understand what absolute hell these Hello Work places are, well, they're hell on absolute earth. But I find it in a strange way consoling to see it so accurately portrayed in a computer game and also to see institutions just like it that are the same in Tokyo as they are in London. Is unemployment just a universal feature of the human race? I don't know. But the important thing is that the party do find employment. They are approached by Nonomiya, a local soapland owner, who is worried that one of his girls hasn't been showing up lately. After a preliminary investigation, the party discovers that she is being blackmailed by a Yakuza-ran care home and is paying huge amounts of her money from her job to avoid her dad being euthanized. The group raids the hospital, kicks some butt, and finishes the job. After finishing the job, they're then joined by her sister, Psycho, who functions as the party's healer. I had her assigned to the idle job throughout most of the game, which is basically my white mage in some form of CC. 
now would be a good time to go into the game's class system. All in all, the game's class system is a bit of a mixed bag. Ichiban has the unique class Hero, which goes up with the social stats, which he can raise through engaging in the story and also the minigames. And he's probably the strongest DPS class in the whole game as a hero. But each character has their own unique class that captures that character's personality. But they can also be reassigned to general classes such as Chef, Fortune Teller, and Musician that you can unlock as you level up and bond with your party through heart-to-heart -heart chats over a glass at the local bar called Survive. Nothing too shocking here. By far the worst part of the party system is the fact that jobs can only be changed at the Hello Work Job Center. And as I've said before, this is never a place that I want to go to, either in its fictional form or its realistic form again. That means if you're grinding a job or suddenly need to swap characters to one of their better jobs for a high-level battle, you're completely out of luck. In this way, the game loses a lot of the attractions of battle systems from something like a game like Final Fantasy V. For this reason, I never changed my character's jobs much throughout my playthrough. I experimented a bit, but I kept them largely in the same jobs, and this seems to have benefited me a lot. Especially because having Ichiban as a high-level hero, and a high-level Seiko as a high-level idol, made the game's combat a lot easier due to their high DPS and high healing potential. Having saved Seiko's sister and found steady employment under the bathhouse owner Nonomiya, the party's temporary tranquility is shattered when they find him recently unalived in his own bathhouse. While the police believe he did this at his own hand, it's later revealed to the party that he was killed by the Chinese mafia, the Lu Mang. As the words heard over the telephone before his death were Lao Ma, the name of a Chinese mafia captain. And in response, Seiko now formally joins the party to seek revenge on Lao Ma. This is where the plot of the game really begins to unfold, think that aforementioned Bill in Ichiban's front pocket, but it's not initially obvious how. It turns out the Chinese mafia are printing counterfeit yuan bills and selling them to the Chinese on the mainland for imported goods. In a sense, they are laundering off the fake yuan to pay for the imported goods. But as we'll see, this is only one element of what is really going on as we continue. Eventually, Lao Ma, a.k.a. Mabuchi, discovers the party is investigating him, in large part due to their totally unsubtle attempts to infiltrate his shipping company, which result in really humorous consequences. And Mabuchi captures the party and is about to hang them and treat them the way we and George used to treat a nice hog before roasting, that Mabuchi explains that he intentionally did away with Donomiya to bait the party into coming after him. But why? Well, Mabuchi wants to frame the party as Yakuza from the local Seiryu clan that are attempting to subvert the peace between the Seiryu clan, a.k.a. the Japanese Yakuza, the Jimin Jol, the Korean Mafia, and the Lu Mang, the Chinese Mafia. Here, the party are introduced to all-round K-pop star-looking badass Junji Han, who will eventually become one of the party's members, or we might call him Junji Han 2.0, but I might get to that later on. Before being rescued, though, from the Lumen Tang completely, the party now goes through what is, in my mind, without a doubt, one of the worst bits of the game. The party now has to fight their way to the surface through this Lumen Tang dungeon, and this can take anywhere between an hour to two hours, depending on how good your party's levels are. And if you saved at the wrong point, there's the potential to sort of be soft lock here if you're not good enough to get out of it. While I find that odd, it's definitely a possibility. But moreover, the real problem is this is not fun. It's a bland dungeon that can feel like something out of a Street Fighter mini game, if you played Street Fighter VI, more than something that's actual content. The only saving grace I can find here is the combat. The combat is fun. Outside of the narrative, as you can tell, I'm completely taken with it, but the combat is also simply fun, even if dungeons like this are grindy and disappointing. This is just your standard Dragon Quest combat, but it works. So let's go into it for a bit. The combat takes two large stats that anyone who's played a Dragon Quest game or a Final Fantasy game will know, HP or SP bars, with mana or SP being interchangeable. You can use SP to use special moves, and there are a wide variety of special moves, many of which, if not most of which, are hilarious. 
from smacking people with cash stacks, throwing CDs at people as ninja stars, and my ultimate favorite, as I've mentioned already, Ari Kimitaki's Thumbtack Scatter, where she scatters thumbtacks in the random direction of enemies, doing massive amounts of damage. The game also takes an action element from retro RPGs like Super Mario RPG, whereby pressing the A button at the correct time allows the user to either increase the damage or parry moves to take on less damage. The game also takes the job system from a combination of Dragon Quest III and Final Fantasy V. Your characters can swap jobs and new jobs open up as you improve your relationship with each of your party members by, of course, sharing a drink with them at the local bar. This section here is easily the low point of the game, though. I mean, this dungeon. And I cannot imagine why the game designers thought this was a good idea. While at the time I was concerned that this would become a staple of the content as the game progressed, thankfully this isn't the case, and the game doesn't get this bad again. But that only makes it more puzzling to me why they did this. It adds to a feeling I'll explain several times later throughout this playthrough that the game does at times, despite its amazing narrative, feel sort of padded out, like a big lengthy JRPG Dragon Quest game. Which is ironic because while Dragon Quest XI is the most recent entry in the series, that has actually avoided a lot of these grindy tropes. But maybe that's a retrospective for another time. So while the Yokohama dungeon is awful, and you might need to go back there to grind a bit later in the game depending on where you're at, the party have nonetheless escaped the clutches of Mabuchi, and we can return to the game's wonderful narrative away from its very bland dungeons. The party proceeds to seek out the Korean Mafia, aka the Jima Jewel, or the Spiderweb, whom they're told have sufficient evidence due to their network of cameras to prove Mabuchi's plan, that is, his plan to start a potential conflict between the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean Mafias, and destroy that very system that protects the bit of Tokyo they're in. But this, like almost everything the party has done so far, does not go entirely to plan. Upon approaching their HQ, the party are confronted by a mysterious woman who leads them further into the building, before eventually disappearing. What follows is yet another sort of mini-dungeon as the party explores this HQ and gets into battle with the Korean Mafia. Finally, upon reaching the end of the dungeon, it's revealed that the mysterious woman is Song Hee, the leader of the Korean Mafia, and she is trying to deduce whether any of them are secretly working with outside forces. And here comes one of the game's first but many plot twists. She reveals to the party that far from being a homeless nurse with substance abuse issues, Namba is pretending to be this, and is in fact the brother of an investigative journalist who has recently gone missing in Njijo. His interactions with Ichiban thus far were, at least according to her, based on his need to find his brother, and he couldn't care less about Ichiban despite the apparent strong bond of friendship they've attained. In fact, he was only interested in the counterfeit bills stuck in Ichiban's front pocket, and that was why he saved his life. More damningly, Nanba does nothing to deny this. As he is dragged from the room by the Jimu Jewel, the rest of the party are told they have been cleared of suspicion. And here we get to one of the most traditional anime or JRPG story beats in Yakuza 7, and I absolutely love the way they've approached it. As you can tell, I've been critical of the combat system so far, but the game knows how to play up the drama of its combat scenes in a way that I absolutely enjoy. Even if you're watching this retrospective and haven't played the game, you can probably suspect how Ichiban is going to respond to the situation, given the fact that he is a real-life JRPG hero. As the Jima Jewel take Nanba away, Ichiban insists they can't touch him. Song Hee explains that he should be thankful to her for revealing his duplicity. But Ichiban, in typical hero fashion, refuses to care about this. Nanba is his friend. He saved his life. They got off the street together. It's only natural for him to do everything in his power to save his family, in this case, his brother, and Ichiban, rather than being angry, is clearly going to do everything he can to assist Nanba in this respect. But first, the Jima Jewel need to take their hands off him because it's clear that they intend to execute him, at least to Ichiban. Now, 
I'm sure we all know this moment from a lot of JRPGs, cowboy films, or anime, where the hero, through his undying loyalty to his friends, stands up for them even when he shouldn't have. But the quality of the acting, the voiceover, the narrative, the writing, and the way it sets up the combat to come is absolutely excellent, and I really enjoyed it. I'd be lying if I said that one of the things I've enjoyed so much in my playthrough isn't the bromance between Ichiba and Nanba that goes throughout. I'd also be lying if I said this scene didn't make me legitimately tear up during watching and scripting this video. My partner happened to walk into the room while I was going through this scene and writing my notes and asked me if I was okay given how emotional I looked. I paused and gestured towards the filming on my monitor and then resumed watching and let her watch the scene. Her only comment was, whoa, this is really good. I think that is a very good summary of Yakuza 7 storytelling. It's just very good. It's authentic and vulnerable to the point of being vastly over the top, but is almost always good. The party now fights what is the hardest battle of the game so far against some Jimmy Jewel and Junji Han. This is the first instance where the game begins to warn you that it could become quite hard. Nanba has now left your party, leaving you with only three members, and Junji Han can one-shot your party members if they are underleveled or have subpar gear. If you haven't done any grinding, this can definitely become a problem. But the seeming randomness of the combat does add a lot of the action that some JRPGs lose when you can either overlevel or overpower fights very easily. And a sudden defeat can keep even JRP veterans like myself on their toes and sort of feeds into the triumph of victory when you do win the battle. Upon winning the battle against Junji Hun, Nanba escapes and Song Hei chastises the party, saying that by letting Nanba go, they have destroyed the Wall of Muscle, that is the alliance that protects Ijin Cho from outside interference from groups like the Yakuza. Regardless of their victory, Nanba will still be pursued and likely be done away with, at least according to her. All they've achieved is putting the fragile peace in the area at risk. After escaping, the party are invited to meet with the Wall of Muscle leadership, though this is not initially revealed. The party arrive at Hainan Tower. Arriving there, they find the head of the Chinese Mafia, the Lu Mintang, Zhao, and the head of the Seiru clan, Hoshino, sat sharing a meal together quite to the party's surprise. It's then revealed to the party that all three groups have formed what they refer to as the Wall of Muscle, the united front of these three groups, all protected under the Liberal Party, ran by the local party chair, Ogi Kubo, who in turn draws his vast political power from the sums of money created by their counterfeiting scheme. While Mabushi was counterfeiting Yuan, that is Chinese currency, the core of the operation the three are involved in is to counterfeit Japanese yen to support the prevailing political establishment that protects them. For some reason, as yet unrevealed, Mabuchi wants to dismantle this operation for his own ends. Eager to save Nanba, the party are told there's only one place he could be hiding from the web of surveillance created by the Jimmy Jewel, the Korean Mafia, that is. They need to get to him before Mabuchi and his goons do, because with him in tow, Mabuchi can succeed in destroying the alliance between the three groups that keeps the city stable and avoids intrusions by outside groups. The party are now told that the most likely place to find Nanba under these circumstances would be the headquarters of the party's nemesis thus far, and that would be Bleach Japan. Upon arriving at Bleach Japan's headquarters, the party meet the leader of Bleach Japan and once again confront Bleach Japan's activist and so far party annoyance, Kume. This is the same Kume that was the original antagonist back in our first quest when we teamed up with Nanba. Kume is surprised to hear the director of Bleach Japan, Okasawara, openly admit that he expected conflict with the Yakuza and was surprised to only find the three of them arriving to save Nanba. And it's worth mentioning at this point something about the management minigame, because for the previous battle and for this battle, the party are likely to want Eri Kamataki, a character that is only achieved by getting to rank 150 in the management minigame. So the party is going to be without Nanba for a reasonable span of the game, and without her, things can get reasonably more difficult than I think they should be, resulting in a somewhat weird difficulty spike. 
The management game is a great example of something that is both complex and at the same time annoyingly simple. You buy businesses and staff them, upgrading the employees and building up the buildings themselves to make more money. You cycle through the four corporate quarters and are rewarded for leveling up into new brackets in the Japanese stock market. At the end, you use your employees in a shareholder battle that's somewhat similar to a Pokemon or gacha game battle. You can counter shareholders' objections to hold them steady in battle, you can eliminate shareholders from battle by spamming attacks on them, and you can use Ichiban's super apologetic abilities to do more damage or to freeze them overall. This system can be simple, but it can also take a while to learn, especially if you're me. My partner described watching me play it as noisy, confusing Pokemon, and this has some accuracy to it. It's red, green, and blue, and they counter each other with a confusing mix of values that influence the way each board member behaves. These battles come about each four quarters that you need to defend your company against the shareholders, and upon successfully doing this, you'll receive quite a lot of rank up. It's also at the end of these battles that you'll receive your money, and that will become important overall. Once I understood and mastered the system, it felt a lot better to me, but it was a surprisingly steep learning curve for a minigame. Getting to number one in this unlocks some insane abilities and more money than the player could ever need. In fact, I feel like the rest of the finances in the entire game are sort of balanced around assuming that you will do the minigame at least some. All that's required for getting Eric Himitaki is level 150, which is reasonably doable even if you don't fully understand the game. I would consider this, though, largely mandatory if you really want to enjoy the game to its fullest. Not only are the preceding battles a lot easier with Eri Kimitaki, she's quite a strong character and is developed, while well, not as well as the main characters that you must have in your party. It would still be quite something to have missed out on. And it's pretty clear to me that the developers want the player to engage in this minigame more than, say, playing Mahjong or Shogi. And I wish that that had kind of been telegraphed to me by the developers more early on, because I definitely would have done so. But again, maybe that's my inexperience with the Yakuza games. Maybe these types of mini games, these management mini games, are sort of always required to progress large aspects of the story. But speaking of story, let's go back to it. It's now revealed that Bleach Japan have spent money on protection in the form of none other than our recurring villain, Mabuchi. The party proceeds to do the obvious and beat Mabuchi, while Ogasawara flees the scene. Upon defeating Mabuchi, he readily admits to Ichiban that the only reason he killed Nonomiya, remember, that was the guy that initially hired us to check on Seiko's father at that Yakuza Ran hospital, was on the orders of Bleach Japan. And it's now that the plot really begins to reveal itself. Mabuchi was working with Ogasawara under the guise of Bleach Japan, to expose the source of Ogikubu's illicit funds. Bleach Japan, despite their outward appearance, are an organization with the goal of destroying the wall of muscle rather than simply a morality or political advocacy group. And they'll achieve this, they think, by exposing the source of illicit funds received by Ogikubo, the local party chair, and the man who gives political power to the wall of muscle. Mabuchi hopes to become the leader of the Omi Alliance by doing this. Remember, that's the same alliance that Masumi Arakawa joined years prior, and the one that Ichiban despises. Mabuchi goes so far as to say that he hopes to have achieved the same level of treachery in the name of the Omi clan against the Wall of Muscle as Arakawa did when he chose to abandon the Tojo clan and join the Omi as one of their new captains. And it's here we get the big plot reveal. As Ichiban gazes on the wall of Bleach Japan's HQ, he finds many news clippings of Ogasawara standing beside none other than Masato Arakawa. Far from being dead, Masato is now the governor of Tokyo and having taken on an entirely new identity as Ryo Aoki, which is the name I'll use for him from now on. Keep that in mind. With Mabuchi now dispatched, Nanba reappears alongside Kume, the local leader of Bleach Japan, and tells the party that there is nothing they can do to stop him from saving his brother, and that he will be there with the Omi Alliance as they attempt to take down the Jumi Jewel surveillance system and acquire direct evidence of the counterfeiting operation of Okikubo and the Wall of Muscle. 
In a sudden reversal of expectation, the party now rushed to defend the Jumi Jewel, that's the Korean Mafia, and allow them time to burn all evidence of their operations. This leads to one of the tensest moments of the entire game. Nanba desperately wants to allow the Omi Alliance and Bleach Japan into the headquarters in hopes of obtaining information on his brother, but the party must do their best to defend the destruction of the HQ in hopes of thwarting Bleach Japan's plan to let the Omi Alliance into Ijincho. This leads to a boss battle against Nanba, the former party compatriot, alongside the recently introduced Ishiyota, an Omi Alliance captain. This battle is rough, and as I've mentioned a lot in this video, if you don't have Eri Kimitaki leveled up sufficiently, this can be quite difficult. Her high DPS abilities really make the difference in getting rid of Nanba, who's a healer, mind you, out of the battle easily and just overall improve the experience, essentially making the battle a cakewalk. As the Jimmy Jewel HQ burns, Nanba is unconsolable, fearing that he's lost any possibility of discovering what happened to his brother. And it's here where I have my first slight critiques of the game's narrative. There is a tendency in Like a Dragon to minimize the negatives and focus on the positive when it comes to the story, with things often miraculously just working out in time. Not unheard of for a JRPG, mind you, but in this case it slightly does annoy me. Song He now steps forward to tell Nanba that his brother has been under their protection the whole time, as it made more sense for them to protect someone who knew so much about their organization than to kill him. He's essentially a well-kept prisoner at this point. This doesn't make entirely that much sense to me. Why attempt to murder Nanba but keep his brother around so that Ichiban had to step in to defend him? Why not just tell Nanba the truth? Why not do the same thing to Nanba, who's also a great resource, as to his brother? Or better yet, why not just reveal this all at the start and get Ichiban on side because Ichiban will eventually now come on to the side of the Jimmy Jewel at this point in the narrative? Am I not following things? But to me, this is a bit of a plot hole. However, let's get back to the story. That's a small complaint in the end. With the Jimmy Jewel's spy network burned to the ground, the former head of the Lu Mang, the Chinese Mafia, and Junji, the assassin of the Jiumi Jewel, now join the party. It feels a bit like a shame to me that they join the party so far into the story. On one hand, it gives you a lot of time to get to know Saiko, Nanba, and Adachi. However, it feels like these two don't get quite as developed as the other characters, as so far in the game they've featured mostly as distant antagonists rather than helping the party. But again, overall, this is a small complaint, as the scenes at Survival Bar that involve these characters are still quite good, and I won't show them in this video because I do want people to play Yakuza 7 and have something other than the main plot spoiled for them. Also, I don't want this video to be 10 hours long. At this point, Ichiban is called to a meeting with the head of the Seiryu clan, and further revelations follow about Hashino and his relationship to Masumi Arakawa. It's revealed that the death of Masumi's father that we witnessed at the beginning of the game was in fact due to his own father's participation in the counterfeit bill scheme, in which he managed to lose a suitcase full of millions of yen. The penalty for this failure was what Masumi witnessed back at the beginning of the game, the murder of his father at the hands of none other than Hashino. As so few people knew about this scheme, he had to die as an example to the few who did and it was Ashino that was tasked all the way back then with doing the deed. He also explains that he later found out this is because the counterfeit yen had been stolen not by Masumi's father, but by his mother and her lover. In the end, not only did she mistreat him and his father, but she acted knowing that such a theft would result in his father taking the blame and being executed. Little did it help, however, as Masumi would soon be orphaned as they too would meet a gruesome end. Now orphaned and with nowhere else to go, Masumi joined a low-ranking family of the Tojo clan, a family who tasked him with body disposal, body disposal where he would place them in Ijincho through his relationship with a local homeless camp. Hoshino tells Ichiban that Arakawa leaving him with the bill meant that he wanted him to survive. 
Hashino goes so far as to speculate that such demands of loyalty are likely because they are blood-related. When Ichiban tells him that it isn't like this, Hashino praises him, saying that he would be lucky to have such loyal subjects amongst the ranks of his clan. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Bleach Japan have managed to lure many of the working girls into an aid and support center, which unsurprisingly is more or less a deportation center, as it's already been revealed in the game that many of the people working in the gray area of the economy in Ijin Cho are illegal workers who will be deported should they be found by the police. But amidst all this drama, Ichiban is obsessed with meeting with Masato Arakawa, a.k.a. Ryu Aoki, and the party proceed through a series of small encounters to get close to him. Upon meeting him, Masato whispers into Ichiban's ear and suggests they meet back at the origin of the plot, the bathhouse that was owned by Nonomiya. They meet again. Masato is disdainful and blunt. Ichiban can live if he never comes near Masumi Arakawa, the father, again. When Ichiban protests, Masato tells him the truth. It was he who committed the murder that Ichiban went to prison for. And then, as the two reach an impasse in their discussion and leave the room, Masato betrays Ichiban and leaves him with no recourse but to fight his goons. Thankfully, our party have been waiting in the wings, seeing this betrayal coming, even though Ichiban was too innocent to suspect it. Meeting up later, Ichiban concludes that the only way to confront Masato, a.k.a. Raouki, I'll stop saying that now, is for Kume, the leader of Bleach Japan, to lose the election. They now task Ashino with the seemingly impossible job of finding a candidate who can beat Kume. While the party are tasked with raising 3 million yen in order to fund that political campaign, and also say once again, you should probably play the mini game to build up that 3 million yen if you don't have it already. And now that we've managed to raise 3 million yen, the game is about to jump up in one of the most discussed difficulty spikes I have ever witnessed in modern JRPGs. Ichiban meets up with one of his Yakuza buddies who informs him that Masumi Arakawa is going into a large meeting of the Omi clan and that he will need Ichiban's support in order to proceed. So with this, the party head off to Sotenbori in Osaka to support him in this upcoming meeting. And by meeting, I think we all know this far in the game, that means big boss battle. Upon arriving there, the party are sat in a hotel room and decide to wander around the city to do some shopping. And in a twist that only this game could do, the shopping mall is under construction and has been turned into a tiered battle arena full of absurdist characters. As I previously said, do not be fooled. This arena is basically not optional content. Personally, I absolutely enjoyed this battle tower and thus didn't feel the difficulty spike the way many people who have played this game seem to have. And I would have hung around the tower longer if only I had the ability to swap jobs on the fly without needing to make the long journey back to Hello Work in order to swap them around. While I had initially heard of this section of the game and approached it with a little bit of trepidation, I think it is well signaled to the player that they should spend some time here, and the fights I found very fun and rewarding, unlike the minigame where it wasn't clearly signaled that this was largely a mandatory part of the content, it's very highly signaled to the player that you should do some grinding here. Still, I'm not a huge fan of hiding the fact that content is basically not optional. Why not have another story dungeon that does the same thing? In the end, if you don't do this tower, you'll likely approach the Omi HQ at between levels 35 to 37. Now, if you want to let me know in the comments whether you could beat the Omi HQ at that level, that's very interesting. But for me, I went in around 46, and that seemed about right to me difficulty-wise. Even at that level, I still burned through a lot of consumables to get through the battle. Upon finishing the grind and finally heading to Omi HQ, I was personally surprised to find that this wasn't the insane gauntlet I'd been told, at least at that level. In fact, I was surprised to find the game engaging in a very basic stealth mechanic that I didn't really see much use in and didn't do much for me. You need to dodge a few patrols, run up some stairs, and everything was going more or less smoothly, but oh boy, that didn't matter when confronting the duo bosses of the level. The two characters are incredibly interesting and detailed in their animations. 
I assume this is from previous Yakuza games I've not played, so I won't comment on that. This battle, while epic, is crazy difficult if you've not leveled properly, and I would think Ichiban would need to be around level 42 to survive some of their larger attacks, otherwise you're likely to get an instant game over. Upon beating the two, Ichiban is informed that they are in fact on the same side, thus raising questions about the purpose of the entire battle in the first place. Some fans of the Yakuza series may have already figured out that they are in fact Tojo clan members, but this was lost on a newbie like me. They have been brought to the city to deal with the meeting of the Omi clan and the release of their leader Watase, who has agreed with Masumi Arakawa that they should disband the organization, and that they all need to meet up the next day. The next day, the party are reunited with Masumi Arakawa and the leader of the Tojo clan, Daigo. It's revealed that Ryo Aoki had been blackmailing the Arakawa family with anti-Yakuza legislation in order to extract more information on the wider Tojo clan. If Arakawa had not caved, someone else would have. The Yakuza are not what they once were when Ichiban entered prison those 18 years ago. They are now on the verge, according to Masumi Arakawa, of becoming government slaves. The leader of the Yomi Alliance has also been in prison and witnessed the same decline of the Yakuza that Ichiban has now that he's been released. The chairman and Masumi tell him that their plan tomorrow is to defeat the Omi Alliance by disbanding it, along with the Tojo clan itself, and making sure that Ryo Aoki, aka Masato Arakawa, cannot take control of either of them through political means. Events on the day go down surprisingly well, to the shock of the Omi Yakuza, and also to my shock, I had been expecting a difficult boss battle at this point in the game. And while the player, like me, might have expected such a boss battle, the presence of the Omi Captain Tendo and his looming figure is actually on the side of the party in aiding the disbanding of the Omi clan. And this is a pleasant surprise for the party to find that he remains loyal to the Omi clan leader and not to Masato Arakawa. This is something that will come up later. Also, there's this dude named Kiryu who shows up and the game makes a rather big deal about it. Later that evening, Ichiban and Masumi Arakawa are finally reunited as a bruised and battered Ichiban lies on the floor of Omi HQ. This, along with the previously discussed meeting with Nanba back in the early chapters of the game, ranks as one of my favorite scenes. We can see Ichiban broken down, the weight of the betrayal he's carried through the game so far finally removed from his shoulders, as Masuma Arakawa leads in and tells him that he did a good job. To this, Ichiban says that he couldn't have done it without his friends and Masumi agrees, saying he's lucky to have friends that are so loyal. The two are reunited later that evening to discuss the events that have transpired so far. The scene is a bit tame, albeit satisfying, but something in my gut at the same time made it feel a bit contrary to the tone of the game so far, although this is something I suspect is intentional. As I'd felt it so far, Ichiban was moving into this new, absurd world, trying to abandon his past, only to have all his doubts about doing that confirmed. Things are the way he always took them to be. And he is who he always thought he was, at least to some extent. Arakawa really is the good guy. His loyalty is rewarded. And the paternal love he wanted so much he finally receives, albeit temporarily as we shall see. His loyalty is paid off, but all is still not as it seems. Masumi explains why he is behind the plan to disband both the Omi and Tojo clans, and to help Yakuza find normal employment in a new post-Yakuza world. In the end, while both are reunited, Masumi Arakawa must also abandon the life the two of them had together 18 years ago. As the conversation wraps up, to the surprise of absolutely no one who's watched a crime drama, Masumi is later gunned down by an unseen assailant after saying goodbye to Ichiban. In a way, the end of this conversation goes some way to addressing the concern I just raised. While it might seem that by being reunited with Arakawa, Ichiban is stepping back into his old life, this couldn't be further from the truth. It's that Masumi is stepping out of his old life, and sadly that new life was cut short by the man he thought was his son.
We now pan back to the fallout of the disbanding of the two major clans, with Sawashiro, our former capo from back in 2001, now former Omi captain, bowing prostrate on the floor in front of a host of Lyakuza leaders. As the scene plays out, Ishioda, the other Omi captain, and someone we've already fought back at the g HQ, enters in. He's offering them large amounts of money, presumably sponsored by Ryu Aoki, to stick with the idea of the Omi clan in the future, claiming all that needs to be done is to recognize the clan under another name. It's become clear at this point that Asawashiro and Ishioda are heading towards a conflict that is going to happen sooner rather than later. The game's story now picks up dramatically in pace as we head towards its conclusion, which is certainly welcome at this point as the plot has become, at least for JRPG, very complex. It emerges that Ryaoki has ordered the assassination of Ashino to end any challenge to Kumi's political campaign. Ichiban, his money now returned by Ashino, has failed to find a candidate to run against Bleach Japan's Kume. In the stead of such a candidate, he suggests that Ichiban himself run. Aoki makes it clear to Sawashiro that this kind of opposition cannot be tolerated and that Hashino must be removed. Even though Ichiban's chances of winning against Kume are minuscule, he cannot tolerate any kind of resistance. Taking his advice, Ichiban confronts Ryo Aoki on the campaign trail and will set in motion this as yet unstated plan to take down the newly found governor of Tokyo. Is it worth mentioning a side plot at this point that Ogi Kibu and the like have now been replaced by Ryaoki, who now has complete political power over most of the city? This plan does not involve them winning the election straight up. But as Ichiban confronts Aoki on the campaign trail, he tells him secretly that Sawashiro recorded proof of his attempt to assassinate Masumi Arakawa. The party, now having been informed that Sawashiro has been tasked with removing Hashino from the picture, in large part due to Ichiban's candidacy as we already discussed, now arrive too late to the scene, finding Hashino dead. The party then see Sawashiro sat there, calmly smoking a cigarette, with Hashino's lifeless corpse sat in his office chair. The party then battles Samashiro, and upon winning the battle, we finally get the big plot reveal of the story, a reveal that I like and also find somewhat disturbing to the narrative so far. Sawashiro tells Kazuya the story of how Masato came to be adopted as Arakawa's son. Long before his time as a Yakuza, Sawashiro was a broke nobody with a pregnant girlfriend who he strongly encouraged not to keep the baby due to their financial strife and his own disinterest in the world. When she refused to go through with it, the baby was born while on her work shift. To get rid of it, the two of them decided to leave the child in the coin lockers in the local bus station. Sawashiro was shocked to suddenly see a then unknown to him, Masumi Arakawa pounding on the locker in which the babe, his child, could be heard crying. After freeing his child, Sawashiro saw Masumi run off seeking medical aid. This was all known to Ichiban at this point from what he had been told all those years ago by Masumi Arakawa back in their failed attempt to eat Peking duck. But what was unknown to Ichiban at this point, in fact to everyone other than Sawashiro, is that after Masumi left, another child began crying with inside the coin locker. This child was in fact the child of Akane, that is, Musumi's lover and the daughter of his Yakuza boss. It was this child that was saved not by Masumi Arakawa and then would become Masato Arakawa, his son. Instead, this child was saved by a random passerby, a Jiro Kazuya, the owner of a local soap land. And this child is, of course, none other than our game's protagonist, Ichiban Kazuya. Yes, not only is Ichiban... Masumi's real son, but Sawashiro has been aware of this the entire span of the game's story. In the end, Sawashiro finally admits that his career as a Yakuza was done only to protect his son. But, on the other hand, 
even though he is loyal to his son, he would never have participated in the death of Masumi Arakawa. In the end, Sawashiro, despite his flaws, is a loyal Yakuza, and he agrees to the party to turn himself into the police for his misdeeds so far. Sawashiro dealt with, the party proceed back to Jimijul HQ to see if their intelligence setup is back up and running after the events we saw in which it was burned down. On the way, the party are confronted by Kiryu, who challenges them that if they want the information they seek, they must battle him. This battle is fun, but it's also clearly fan service. Ichiban might be like a dragon, but Kiryu is the dragon of the Yakuza series. And winning this battle merely makes Kiryu breathe harder. It's also advised to take both Eri Kimataki and Saiko into the battle, as Kiryu refuses to attack women. Yes, that's an actual boss mechanic. Upon our inevitable defeat to the dragon, we proceed to Jima Jewel HQ and talk to Songhei, who tells them that Tendo, the now presumed head of what was the former Omi clan, has been tasked with Aoki with executing the now disgraced Sawashiro while he is in prison. They've discovered this due to the appearance of an infamous assassin named Mirror Face, who can copy other people's appearances. Yes, the game just does take some utterly comic book twists at surprising points. The party now chase down Ishioda and his assassin Mirror Face, who, surprisingly, has now disguised himself as our compatriot Adachi in order to leverage his police connections to get close to Sawashiro in his cell. As the party defeats both of them, though, another twist emerges. It's revealed that Tendo has planned the elimination of both his rivals, Sawashiro and Ishioda. As a bomb explodes, leaving everyone involved presumed dead. Tendo, meanwhile, being the last remaining former Omi Clapton, has been tasked with the search of the Millennium Tower, the HQ of Aoki's political campaign. Because as we saw before, the party have threatened Aoki with information that Sawashiro may have leaked or could leak to the press. Knowing that Tendo is searching their HQ, the party charge into the Millennium Tower, which looks suspiciously like Tartarus from Persona 3, and upon beating through its levels, confront Tendo. With Tendo finally defeated, the party's plan can now go into full effect. Meanwhile, as the party were climbing the Millennium Tower, Aoki is at a political rally when the banner is suddenly changed to report that he has been accused of murder. Shocked by this revelation and accusing it of fake news, Aoki immediately proceeds to check on what Tindo has been up to at the HQ. Hearing nothing in reply, he rushes back to the headquarters. Aoki rushes into the party HQ to discover a satisfied-looking Tindo at the top floor, with Ichiban's party lying strewn, defeated around the room. Tindo explains the party's failed ruse, explaining to Aoki that there was no tape to begin with. In response, Aoki flies into a rage and begins listing off various crimes he wants Tendo to do in reprisal for these actions. Staring down at the defeated body of Ichiban, only for Ichiban to once again level up. To Aoki's surprise, Tendo is defeated, lying unconscious behind the desk. It is not Tendo, but a recently, presumably, rehired mirror face that Aoki has been relating his criminal plans to. And this has all been recorded by Sanko waiting in the wings and ready to be uploaded. Aoki orders his guards to eliminate the party and seize the footage, and the game's final battle thus ensues. Compared to Tendo or even Sawashiro and Ishioda, Aoki is a weak pushover, and his group of thugs are soon defeated. And because this is a Yakuza game, and even I as a novice know this, the series must now end with Aoki and Kazuha rushing toward the top of the Millennium Tower for a one-on-one -on -one fight. Unsurprisingly, this is not a challenging battle and Ichiban makes quick work of Aoki in what is an utterly brutal beatdown of his once beloved friend. With Aoki defeated, the police now storm the building and are shown the footage of Aoki admitting his crimes. To avoid arrest, Aoki takes a police officer hostage and temporarily flees the scene. After wandering disheveled and beat up through the streets of Tokyo for some time, 
He once again arrives at Shinjuku Station by the coin locker where he was found. It is here he is once again confronted by Ichiban, who knows that he would have been there. He admits to Ichiban that it was the hostess all those years ago that caused him to become who he was, and that she did in fact marry the very police chief she mocked him with those 18 years ago, the very same police chief that he would go on to control as governor. He now slowly takes out the gun he's been carrying thus far and puts it back in the coin locker he was initially found in, symbolizing his defeat and oncoming end of his life. When years later he explains the same hostess met him as a young and upcoming politician, she didn't even recognize him. And it is this sense that has caused Masumi to entirely lose himself and any direction he had as a human being. Ichiban pleads at excruciating length for Aoki, or perhaps now we should say Masato, to turn himself in to the police for his crimes and try and start over, just as Ichiban did. He believes that Masato can do this as well. But just as Masato finally begins to cave after a dramatic and emotional scene, finally breaking down in tears and seeming to beginning to accept his failure, he is suddenly approached and stabbed by Kume for his hypocrisy. Kume is not all disheartened with the cause, but only blames Aoki for not being pure enough to further their own sense of moral superiority, and he walks away, having committed murder as if it were nothing. In the end, and I feel this way about a lot of Japanese media in film, anime, and gaming, I love the consistency of the themes involved, even if it's something as simple as a cooking show. As I said at the beginning of this retrospective, Yakuza 7 is a story about the difficulty of self-transformation, embracing change and finding yourself lost, or not who you thought you were at an unexpected point in your life. This is not a coming-of-age novel. In fact, most of the characters are getting well on into middle age. They don't bond like your traditional Squaresoft or Enix heroes, as they become more confident in who they are over a cup of tea. Instead, the characters of Yakuza 7 now already have lives. They're deeply flawed. They bond by pounding back whiskey and discussing their past mistakes, but also how they hope to rectify them in the future. These characters already have a long history before the player ever boots up the game, and I love that. If you're watching this video so long, I want to say thank you. This is by far the most effort I've ever put into a YouTube video. It's now totaling hundreds upon hundreds of hours. If you're one of my long-term subscribers, there's more retrospectives to come, and hopefully now my health is better, and I've learned the workflow for these types of video. I'll be out more often. If you can please like and subscribe if you got this far, it's great to keep my motivation up, and any constructive comments are always welcome, as I really want to get good at making this type of video. And so the game ends with Adachi finally getting to arrest the corrupt police chief that caused so much of the story. Ichiban, in turn, decides to remain in Injincho, claiming that he's made enough friends along the way that this is where he finally feels at home and where he can do the best work. Though with the coming of Infinite Wealth, the second game in this series, I suspect this isn't the end of Ichiban's story, nor of him on this YouTube channel. And with all that, at the end of Yakuza 7, I think it's safe to say I can still enjoy RPGs. Peace.